my name's Dr. Elisa Bongetti and I'm a renal registrar uh, currently working at the Royal Melbourne Hospital in Australia. Today I'm going to talk about classification of small vessel anchor associated vasculitis. So why does classification of anchor associated vasculitis matter? A meaningful classification system does need to enable us to make an efficient diagnosis and, and provide targeted treatment to facilitate uh, care in our patients, as well as um, a system that can be used in clinical trials. The limitations of existing systems is that we rely heavily on signs and symptoms rather than anchor specificity, which can create issues due to the significant overlap in symptomatology between the various uh, vascular disease. And it can also cause subjectivity in um, diagnosing patients. And this is important because there are different outcomes of prognosis and recommended treatments for people depending on their anchor specificity and current systems don't reliably, reliably incorporate that into classification. And in addition to that, there's no universal agreed upon classification system that we currently have um, to make our diagnoses. What are the differences that we see in patients um, depending on their different anchor associated vasculitis? This is a really good diagram from a recent paper published in um, Nature Review Disease Primers by um, Richard Kitching and his team. And it shows that, for instance, in microscopic poly polyangiitis, um, it's more likely to involve the kidneys compared to GPA or EGPA. Whereas granulomatosis with polyangiitis is more likely than EGPA or MPA to involve the sinuses and the nose. And eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis is more likely than the other two small vessel vasculitides to involve the lungs. So you can, however, you can see that there's significant overlap in symptomatology. So we have a clinically based nomenclature system, um, which is the 2012 International Chapel Hill Consensus Conference. It's the most widely used, used criteria for systemic vasculitis, and it stratifies vasculitides according to vessel size and their clinical features. However, it is technically not a classification system. It is a nomenclature system, which means it's, it's intended to provide a framework for uh, inferring and verifying diagnostic criteria, but it in itself is not intended to be used for diagnostic purposes. And here is a diagram which illustrates nicely the differences in classification of vasculitides depending on um, vessel size and of course anchor associated vasculitis involves small vessels. And so microscopic polyangiitis is an often causes a necrotizing glomerulonephritis. And what is important to know is that granulomatous, granulomatous lesions are absent in this disease. Whereas granulomatosis with polyangiitis does have um, the involvement of necrotizing granulomatous inflammation, and it often involves the upper and lower respiratory tract. However, glomerulonephritis is also common. And in eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, we typically see eosinophil rich and necrotizing granulomatous inflammation involving the respiratory tract and asthma is commonly associated with this condition. The advantages of the Chapel Hill nomenclature system is that up to 30% of people with a small vessel vasculitis are seronegative. And obviously it's important that we understand the typical differences in clinical presentation to help us um, make a diagnosis. So it does provide that framework for us. However, the disadvantage is that it isn't a diagnostic classification system as mentioned, and it doesn't reliably distinguish between MPA or GPA because it relies on there being an absence of granulomatous lesions to make a diagnosis of MPA. However, um, sometimes these lesions may be missed due to a sampling error when we're doing a biopsy, so it's not entirely reliable. Other classification systems include the American College of Rheumatology classification system. However, this was launched prior to when um, microscopic polyangiitis was recognized as a separate entity, as well as the European Medicines Agency algorithm. However, this also does not reliably distinguish MPA as a separate disease. What are the differences between anchor associated vasculitis based on anchor specificity? This table highlights nicely an overview of the differences between PR3 anchor and MPO anchor. And in particular, I'll focus on organ involvement, prognosis and response to therapy. 
So first of all, response to therapy. Um, so we know that people with PR3 anchor uh, tend to respond better to rituximab compared to cyclophosphamide, whereas people who have an MPO anchor have a similar response whether or not rituximab or cyclophosphamide is used. And in terms of organ involvement, well, anchor specificity is a major determinant of um, what organs are uh, involved. For instance, um, in uh, eGPA, patients who are anchor negative are more likely to have alveolar hemorrhage, um, renal involvement, peripheral nerve involvement, whereas if they're anchor positive, they're more likely to have a cardiac involvement and increased mortality. Patients with GPA who are MPO positive have a milder uh, clinical course compared to those who are PR3 positive. In terms of mortality, MPO anchor is a, as a worse prognostic indicator than PR3, whereas patients who are PR3 positive are more likely to have a higher rate of relapse compared to those who are MPO positive. And anchor specificity is also really important for genetic studies because we know that um, uh, diseases segregate more closely in, with anchor specificity than clinical phenotype. What are the limitations though, of relying too heavily on anchor specificity for diagnosis and disease classification? Well, for instance, not all anchors are necessarily pathogenic. There can be patho pathogenic anchors and non-pathogenic anchors depending on epi epitope specificity. As mentioned, up to 30 percent of patients with a small vessel vasculitis are actually seronegative, and there's still a significant clinical overlap um, with the uh, clinical course um, with different um, MPO or PR3 anchor positive patients. What research is currently being done to create a classification criteria? Well, there is the diagnostic and classification criteria in vasculitis study, which aims to update the current classification system. They have finished recruiting. It ran between 2011 and 2017, recruited over 6,000 patients. Um, and so, uh, and it was including patients from 136 sites in 32 countries. So the takeaway points from today's talk is that existing systems do not reliably include anchor specificity and none of the existing systems reliably distingu distinguish between um, MPA and GPA. Current systems rely more so on a consensus opinion rather than being data driven and they are not intended necessarily for diagnosis, they're often nomenclature systems. So future systems would ideally include both clinical, radiographic, histological, genetic, and serological criteria to acknowledge that this is a heterogen there's great heterogeneity across the spectrum of anchor associated vasculitis. Thank you.